Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Withrow, and I'm the head of exhibitions and publications at the McMichael. It's my pleasure to welcome you virtually this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the topic tonight is Black women artists in Canadian art history. And this discussion was inspired by two exhibitions that we have on at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection right now. Uninvited Canadian Women Artists in the Modern Moment, which is an exploration of uh, art by women in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And Denise Tomaso's Odyssey, a mini retrospective on a Trinidadian Canadian artist who was in her prime uh, when she passed away too soon, uh, unexpectedly in 2012. I'll begin with a land acknowledgement. The McMichael Canadian Art Collection is located on the original lands of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe people. It is uniquely situated along the Carrying Place Trail, which historically provided an integral connection for Indigenous people between Ontario's Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. As an institution, McMichael recognizes the importance of acknowledging the original territories of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe First Nations people and other Indigenous nations. We at McMichael are so proud to be able to offer engaging and meaningful discussions around the art of Canada free of charge to audiences across Canada and beyond. Uh, if you're not already a supporter of the McMichael, allow me to ask you to consider joining our family of supporters who get special access to all kinds of uh, good things coming out of the McMichael and their support allows us to keep giving Canadian art the world class treatment that we feel and we know you feel it deserves. Uh, we've made it really easy to make a contribution of any size with a few clicks of mouse or taps on your screen. You can also support the McMichael by visiting us. Uh, we're open six days a week. Tickets are available on our website. Uh, you can also support us by buying our books. Uh, Uninvited and Denise Tomaso's Odyssey are both uh, have accompanying publications. They are available in person in our shop and through our eShop. Uh, special thanks for this evening's uh, program to the Toronto Friends of the Visual Arts who help us on an ongoing basis with our programs. And a special hello to members of the audience who are coming to us through the good people at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria. They will be presenting our Denise Tomaso show uh, opening later this year. Before we dive into tonight's program, I'll just cover a few quick basics. Firstly, this talk is being recorded. So if right now you're thinking of someone who um, should really be with us tonight, let them know uh, to look for uh, the recording on our YouTube channel uh, in the coming days. Uh, secondly, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please use it. Uh, we have time reserved at the end for questions. Um, I'd like to introduce our moderator. Many of you already know Sarah Milroy, one of Canada's most respected public voices and champions of Canadian art. She has been our chief curator at McMichael since 2018. She was the curator of our exhibition Uninvited and co-curator of Denise Tomaso's Odyssey. Uh, Sarah uh, has brought together three honored guests coming from three different provinces uh, to join us this evening. I'll introduce each very briefly and then I will yield the floor to them. <laughs> Uh, coming to us from East Preston, Nova Scotia, is Clara Clayton Guff. She's a basket maker and the granddaughter of Selena Irene Sparks Drummond, whose beautiful baskets are featured in our exhibition, Uninvited. Hailing from Montreal, but coming to us from Toronto, is Gaetan Vernad, director and artistic director of the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery. She's a greatly admired colleague, a good friend to our museum, and guest co-curator of our Denise Tomasos exhibition. And coming to us from Montreal is Adrian Johnson, a PhD student in art history at McGill University, whose research examines 19th and 20th century African and Black Canadian and African diasporic landscape artists. And she's co-founder of the Ethnocultural Art Histories Research, which is a student-driven research community based at Concordia. So with that, I will uh, yield the floor finally um, to Sarah. Take it away. You betcha. Okay, so I'm going to just... Um rest here for a moment on top of Denise Tomasso's beautiful painting Odyssey, which is right now uh, in our downstairs galleries for a few more days um, at the McMichael. And I want to just talk before I turn over to my dear friend Gaetan, I, I just wanted to say, you know, how this Tomasso show kind of came to be, which is um, Denise is someone whose work I loved for many, many years. When I came in to do my um, job um, interview for this position at, um, at the McMichael. Denise was one of the artists I talked about saying, this is the kind of Canadian art that we need to be embracing as we sort of 
expand the purview of the McMichael beyond the pale and the male, which God bless them, uh, the group of seven and their contemporaries have been the core of our mission and the, our founders leading gift to the institution. But the story of Canadian art, of course, now is so much wider and more diverse than that. And Tommaso, you know, seems to me like such an important artist for us to, to be learning about it. I think Michael and Gaetan will help us to know more. Um, but the timing of the show really came around a problem that I think um, Adrian will understand all too well, which was looking for Black women artists in Canada that were active in the 1920s and 30s. Now, I know Adrian feels my pain because she's been doing the same thing for about six years now in her PhD uh, research. But it turned out to be extremely difficult. And at the end of the day, Adrian can explain to us why we were unsuccessful. Um, but we did, we, we sort of realized that we were looking in the wrong places. We were looking for careers in painting and sculpture when 90% of Black women in Canada were engaged in domestic service. Um, so obviously there was a reason that we were not successful in our efforts and we had to turn around and look at other modes of, of cultural production that were going on in Black communities among women at that time. And that's where we get to the wonderful story of Irene Selena Sparks Drummond, Clara's wonderful grandmother, whose baskets are in our show at the McMichael. So that's kind of how, you know, how this is structured tonight. We're going to move from one idea of history, Denise Tomasos paintings laden with history, a diasporic history and, and, and current events and everything about the now and the then. Then we're going to go to Adrian and hear about her deep recherche in the 19th century and some extraordinary finds that she's made about the deeper story of, of Canadian art and Black women within it. And then we're going to end up, Clara, with you in your kitchen in East Preston, Nova Scotia, to hear about your grandmother and her, and her very beautiful work. So without any further ado, um, please uh, tell us, Gaetan, about your own encounters with uh, Denise's work over your long friendship with her and what you see in these paintings now when you look at them from the point of view of, of history. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, Adrian. It's a real pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, it's, uh, I can't wait to hear Clara talk about her mother's work. And for me- um, and grandmother's. A, a grandmother's work. Grandmother's yeah, that. Mother <laughs> and grandmother. Yeah. She comes from a, a long legacy of strong Black women, and I, I could not be happier than to be in the company of all of you together. So Denise Tomasos is, um, as Sarah said, an artist who found was really distinct when, um, so I started at um, my, one of my first professional uh, jobs was to be the curator at um, what was then the Bishop's University Art Gallery and now called the Foreman Art Gallery. And I was uh, puzzled. Um, it was around the turn of the 2000 and receiving a postcard from um, the Canada Council and seeing this incredible painting that we will see a work later on that is akin to that series of, of works, which to me look more or uh, the shutters of a house, um, um, I didn't see abstract painting as I was looking at this. And I was often confronted with the idea that I did not like painting, realized that I didn't, I didn't see painting that spoke to me. The, oh, What's really wonderful there about- it is. There's the Kente. Oh, there it is, yeah. yes. So this, this is akin to the type of work I was looking at from uh, this postcard from uh, Canada Council because Denise has received this really great grant at the turn of 2000 to do a, a masterful project. And from this postcard and this, uh, this, this uh, really serendipitous meeting of receiving a postcard from Canada Council, we then started uh, uh, talking about doing an exhibition uh, together. And at the time I was interested in doing was doing an exhibition. But Denise uh, early on understood that though she would have a career where she was a professor at Rutgers University, she had two galleries, one based in Toronto, Olga Korper, and another Bay New York, which no longer exists at, at this point. Um, she was successfully commercially, um, unlike many African artists at the time, and this is really important. And the, this is some that uh, an artist like Stanley Whitley, Whitney, who is in gallery told me, Denise was ahead of the curve back had two commercial galleries and Stanley didn't have any. Denise understood that not only 
would she need to do her practice as a painter within the realm of the gallery space, a commercial gallery, but she also needed to find a specific place for her artwork in the um, non-for-profit and public art galleries. And um, what I thought was going to start as an exhibition of painting ended up being an exhibition where she did direct wall painting on the um, on the walls of Harvard, sorry, on the walls of the Foreman Art Gallery. And then um, hence a second part of the exhibition, another series of wall paintings were on the walls of Mount St. Vincent University in Halifax. So we're full circle. We're back to a relationship of Quebec or Eastern, you know, Quebec, mm -hmm. Ontario, as well as with Halifax. So if we could, if we can go back to the first, um, the slide. Oopsie. Oh, so this is Denise. There she is. Um, there's <laughs> Denise. And this is um, Denise um, in, um, at, at the Foreman Art Gallery. And what you see in the background is this large scale um, uh, work that she did. What's really important for anyone to understand Denise Tomaso's work is that painting and the active movement of painting is really important in her practice. Uh, her work is really about structures, structures that her Earlier on in her career, she was always interested, very political, very uh, activist as an individual mm -hmm. and uh, civil rights, human rights were things that were very important to her. But interestingly enough, she starts her career or at least as a student at uh, U of T to be, to be interested in uh, doing very representational figurative painting. And then she starts researching structures such as slave ships, architecture, and building. And then you see how lines become really important in the space that she creates. So she removes the representation of bodies, mostly the black bodies, is removed from the space, but everything about how she paints and how she uses color to construct the space is as a leitmotif for these, the, the absence of the black body, but which is signified in the space that she's presenting us. So if you think of the, the, the structure of those, those slave ship, and you think of the entrapment of the body and how the same entrapment of this body is represented in a work such as Displaced Burial or Burial at Gore, which makes reference to the Middle Passage, you, there's no representation of any bodies, but to anyone who understand what it means to be in Gore, you know that we're talking about slavery and slaved bodies that are significant. Gaetan, I was kind of just gonna interject that I think one of the incredible things about this painting is it's very, very large, it was up on the wall. What actually happens is you become the body. Yes. I mean, you, you know, as the viewer, you are totally, engrossed in this and so there's no figuration yet the, the body is very present it's your body which is extraordinary feat for a painter to to achieve yes and i think you're absolutely right because once you're in front of that work you you as you stand in front of it and for those of you who haven't been to the mcmichael please go the exhibition is ending on october 24th and please go and stand in front of this work because mm -hmm. you feel you feel entrapped by it and uh, the way we chose uh, to present it, it's alone on this large wall. And uh, what originally I felt, Sarah, could have been yeah. we were fighting with the space, but because of the strength of the work, the mm -hmm. space disappears and we're, we are those bodies. Yeah. And for black folks, you will feel it without even thinking of it. And for people who are not of African, <clears throat> Or the African diaspora, you can then start imagining what it means if you think of slavery, slave boats. And then what I think is really interesting in, in Denise's work and really important for the, is all these series of black and white large scale works were really important because at that moment she did those paintings in order to move from Philadelphia to New York. And through this work, she gets a job at Rutgers University as a professor. So the, all these series of black and white works are really important in the trajectory of her work. We can move to the next slide. 
And so of how drawing is also at the source of her work. This is a drawing that, um, a preparatory drawing for another site-specific wall work that she did at um, Oakville Gallery. And I must say that uh, it's great with great pride. And I can say it because Denise always said it to me after the show at the Foreman Art Gallery and Mount St. Vincent University and the publication of the only catalog of her, of her work uh, at that time, she was then invited by the AGO to do uh, a wall, a wall uh, drawing, and then after she was invited at um, Oakville Art Galleries to do another work. Um, and what's amazing about this is that in this work that you see here, you see how she composes, how she thinks of space, and how drawing is very much uh, integral to how she understands space. And um, interestingly with Denise is that she can, she would work on different scales of work simultaneously. So as she's thinking of the specific wall drawing, she's also thinking of um, when she did a series of work, she would work on large scale, small scale, drawing everything simultaneously. And the, the, the magic and the beauty of seeing the work uh, assemble at the McMichael is that you will see that regardless of the scale of the works that are shown, because we have some very small works and some very large work, the one element is um, use of space, mm -hmm. use of line, uh, expression of like the body in the space. It's as if you can feel the breath or the movement, the heartbeat of the artist moving on the canvas or on, uh, on right here on the, the piece of paper. And then, um, so again, if we start with the entrapment of the black body within, um, um, within the slave ship, the black body within a cage, body within a city, then the black body, our own entrapment in our minds. And then towards the end of her, of her short lived life, she was also very much, and we could go to the next slide, much interested in um, um, prison complexes. Mm -hmm. So this type of panecticon where bodies are entrapped and constantly being observed. And if we, if we bring this, and we all have to think that this is 2003 and she passed away in 2012. And if we circle back to the recent events of you know, the films uh, that have been made on the you know, militarization of prison complexes, the films, um, all of the research on the scene of uh, systematic imprisonment of, um, of um, African-American uh, people uh, at a higher level than during the period of slavery. And then if we think of the of, of this entrapment and this constant, um, um, let's say, stereotypical view of Black folks, mental health um, effect of this, you yeah. understand how this line, this structure is central to, to what Denise is showing us. And it's, it's always intended to speak of the human body embedded in that structure. And these structures that kindness and I think that what you like when you walk through the show I think what's so amazing is that you see you know the structure of you know of, of the slave ship and then the structure of the um, maximum security prison and then the structures of the industrial port and of cities more generally and then there are also paintings of burial grounds mm -hmm. that are very evocative so you know this she, she you never are quite sure what it is you're looking at but there's a deep sense of, of historical looking, I think, in, in her paintings of like being reminded, as it were, it's always pregnant with the past, it seems to me at least. No, and, and I would say that, that you're, mm -hmm. the other element that's important is that what Denise also looked at, she looked at textile, she looked at vernacular architecture, because she came from Trinidad, Tobago, she, she has a wide mixed heritage of uh, from Africa, from India, from China. Um, she traveled. She it was really important for her to to touch on all of these these diverse points that were embedded in her. 
And so you will see in the show, there's these beautiful um, images of, of um, drawings that she did of these Chinese uh, burial grounds that are embedded in uh, mountain faces in, uh, in China. And so again, it's the same structure that's repeated. And so I think that, um, that regardless of the title, and that's really interesting, regardless mm -hmm. of the titles of the work, regardless of the timeline of the work, it's as if it is a continuous evolving mm -hmm. conversation about how she chose to uh, become a painter mm -hmm. and how she decided to be dis that her work would be distinct from other artists. And mm -hmm. in doing this, and when you look at the black and white works or at the works with color here, you see that at the base of everything, color is shaping that she's sharing with us. And in each of these spaces, the human body is signified even though it's not represented. I think one of the things that we talked about too, that just before we move on, that I thought was really interesting is the way in which all these spaces are not, they're not anchored. They don't go down to the ground. You know, there's the sense of here in this work, Odyssey, which is just, um, uh, come into the McMichael's collection as a promised gift. They're structures and they're moving. And this is one of her favorite shapes is this sweeping up to the right hand, driving up and forward. But everything is kind of, everything is kind of floating and not really anchored. And I, I think, you know, you're right, Gaetan, in our conversations that there's something about a diasporic condition in mm -hmm. that kind of, you know, moving for necessarily with roots down, but kind of making the passage, making making a future um, all the same. Like these paintings are dealing with the toughest subjects, but they're amazingly optimistic feeling when you when you're in them, you feel a, a surge of energy. And and I would say, you know, again, this this notion of vessels, the mm. water, the sea, the travel. So of course we come back to the middle passage because it was it is a constant. Uh, light motif. It's a constant preoccupation uh, for her, they, but a preoccupation that she also ties into her own history in terms of this notion of migration, how we move from places to places. And we are very much like we carry with us, you know, these places with us because you, you, you know, whether you move like she did from Trinidad, Tobago, to Toronto at the age of eight, and mm -hmm. then you move to, to the USA, you know, from Toronto to Yale, um, and then after Philadelphia, and then New York, which was a very important part of her being and her life. And at the same time that she's sedentary, she's constantly traveling, constantly trying to tie back the different threads of her life, which I really like this notion of the, again, the structure of, of weaving, right? And when we talk about basket making or when we, if we think about, you know, African diasporic works um, and the long tradition of, of quilt making in, um, in, um, in Nova Scotia and in most rural communities, whether it's G's Bent in the US, you know, that has been researched more in depth, but also the, re the research uh, that is being done now uh, around Halifax uh, for, and so, I feel that it's it's really it was a great idea to 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 uh, have Adrian and Clara talk from their different perspective because even though for all of our listeners you might think what does Denise Tomaso has to do with <laughs> any of this besides the fact that she's a black woman but I think her looking at vernacular yeah. architecture her looking at textiles mm -hmm. brings us back to again. Um, um, these types of, of uh, structures and how she is a structural painter, you know? And, how... yeah, and bringing in different kinds of sources for artistic inspiration yes. too. But, you know, drawing from different traditions to, to move forward as a painter. So, so I, so that's Gaitan, all I will. Okay, well, look, that's fantastic. And think, I think what I have to say, Gaitan, is because we've been together on this Denise Tomasa's Odyssey, please, co-host as we move forward and ask questions, don't hold back as we as we go on to Adrian and then finally to Clara because your insights are always so helpful and I'd love your company. Thank you. At the helm here. So Adrian, 
this is going to be a bit of a marathon because I you we have <laughs> a lot to say. And you know, Adrian is so explosively um, enthusiastic about her her subject and has done so much work in the area of the sort of missing careers of Black Canadian women artists that were only now, thanks to her uh, and a handful of other scholars in Canada that are working very hard, starting to you know pull these narratives forward. And um, you know, I, I met up with Adrian only. I, I watched your Kwahi uh, talk online that you gave a, a couple of years ago, which was fantastic. But it it made me feel a little bit better because it helped me to understand why I hadn't been able to find any careers of Black women artists in the 20s and 30s. But you know, you've then I've learned so much more from you since then that put that lacuna in a kind of context that I think is very helpful. So you're going to tell me when you want to advance your slides. And um, um, I am yours to command. Okay, that is perfect. We can actually leave it there for a moment. Okay. Um, um, thank you so much for um, this uh, opportunity to sit and uh, be among um, such amazing um, scholars, curators, um, artists, uh, individuals. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, so as, oh, sorry. So as mentioned, my name is Adrian uh, Johnson. I am a third year student of art history at, at McMichael Gallery, no, at <laughs> <laughs> McGill University. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> McGill. And at McGill University. And my, my passion, quite frankly, has um, over the past 10 years, yes, since my undergrad, um, has been um, trying to understand the ways in which um, Black, uh, sorry, African and Black Canadian artists are and are not visible in Canadian art um, for the late 19th to the early 20th century. Um, Shall we advance? Yes, please. Um, so um, just a little well, bit of background. Period, this is the period then right before the period that um, is taken in by Uninvited, which is 1920. To 1945. So it's kind of the backstory to what we're doing in Uninvited, which is really helpful. Thank you so much for reminding me about the line I missed <laughs> in my in my in my statement. Um, I I thank you for uh, uh, for the time frame here. Um, I do, as we've discussed, I really feel uh, be able to, to present these artists, um, particularly the the earliest being Edith Hester McDonald Brown, because in the, the most strictest you know, definitions of modern yeah. artists, they, she fits and these artists fit. And yes, so it's, I feel it's a great uh, to sh share information. Um, so by way of background, I never be an art historian. <laughs> I was always in, intrigued by art. I am a main curator at um, a club called the Salon d'Aomé from 2000, 2006 and, and had another opportunity to work at Gallery Mosaic. Um, closed in 2010 for five years. It was um, in the plateau, I believe, the one of the few, uh, one of the only um, art galleries dedicated to um, representing African, Caribbean, and Black Canadian artists. Um, and it was actually from that experience, and particularly all the engagements I had with such so many different artists from so many different areas that inspired me to go into academia and really find out what this field of is. However, um, prepared me for the absolutely confounding absence in representation of Black Canadian artists my first year of um, my BFA in 2011. The earliest examples of Black Canadian art presented were from 1990, specifically uh, Stan Douglas's Utka yeah. and Usage phenomenal video entitled Explain Black from 1992. What's troubling here are the implications in perpetuating uh, such a glaring absence of Black Canadians as artists and their authorship is the, the way that it perpetuates specifically anti-Black racist stereotypes about Blacks, their being, and their intellectual abilities. 
firstly, in regards to the hypervisibility of Black contemporary artists in displays and discourses of Canadian it can be read as perpetuating a means or only recent immigrants to Canada. Mm -hmm. Secondly, if I may remit, the beginning of contemporary art is debated to have begun somewhere between 1945 and 1989. The, not only is the representation of Black Canadian artists um, as of 19, active as of 1990, slightly dis, uh, quite disingenuous, it also amputates a very rich um, artistic and cultural practice that had existed here since the, the, late, the late 60s. Even more sinister about the, uh, the lack of the absence of Black Canadian artists since 1834, the abolition of slavery in Canada, is the fact that 17th century Eurocentric constructs of fine art were intricately linked to constructions of civilized and human. In this way, fine art colluded with prevailing utter utterances for the justification of Africans, as among other qualities, they lack the capacity to be human because they lack the capacity to make art. Indeed, art came to stand as one of the higher intelligences in the raciology of the colonial globe. Um, so it is with, oh, shall we go, with, oh, we go yes, on to the next slide, Adrian? Yes, I was just going to ask, yeah. yes, you can, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, this evening, I would just like to give a brief introduction of three amazing, um, Black Canadian women artists, um, Edith Hester McDonald Brown, Edith Clayton, and Artist Lane. You can move the slide. Okay, and we should explain that Edith Clayton is Clara's mom. Oh yes, and uh, I, sorry, sorry. I did that when we we're talking. Which is pretty me. great. Yeah. So oh, here, and I should. And I, and I, I do invite. I do invite any corrections for anything I may have. Oh, it's just, it's, not even it's just interesting. Yeah. So I, I miss photograph. Anything I misrepresent, please correct me. <laughs> Tell us about this amazing-looking woman. But this outstanding portrait is. Um, the portrait of the artist, Edith Hester, from analyzing the photograph, I believe she was about 16 years old at the time of um, taking that photograph. Um, I believe it was around 1901, 1905, um, based on her, um, they're called mutton sleeves. Mm -hmm. So they go a little bit out of fashion afterwards. So somewhere in that time. And um, uh, while work does continue in constructing a more comprehensive picture of McDonald's life, interviews beginning in summer of 2012, um, sorry, at the home of, Edith, of, of Edith's a granddaughter, mm. um, who had brief contacts with her during her youth, provides some insights. Miss Parker, Edith's granddaughter, states that McDonald is a descendant of John Brown, a black refugee who was one of the eight first families of the Campbell Road Settlement established between 1835 and 1840. McDonald was one of four children of Jessica and Thomas, uh, Jessica Brown and Thomas George McDonald, where Jessica ran a, a general store. Thomas worked as a porter on the National Canadian Railway. Um, if you can turn to the slide. Yeah. The course of my research supports that McDonald's five known paintings dated from 1898 to 1911 are currently the, uh, currently the earliest examples of paintings produced by an African Canadian woman. Each of the works um, shown were executed in oil with highly finished near invisible brush strokes and they are all in their original frames. Mm -hmm. uh, McDonald's signature appears consistently at the lower right of the paintings. And until uh, February 2013, um, none, all of the, uh, sorry, the only painting to have been exhibited publicly is the painting at the lower, um, I believe, right? Lower right, yeah, the bison. Which oh, is sorry, not the, the, the lower left. <laughs> flowers. <laughs> the flowers, yes. So the other, the other paintings, um, I've been showing them 
<laughs> to my heart's content ever since 2012, just out of the sheer excitement of the possibility of a black woman um, creating a vision, um, which is which is which is is such a powerful um, um, expression of possession. And when we consider the period that she lived in, black people were non figures. They were they were of very little consequence. They were literally imagined as apart from this great white north. Um, so I, I, I so forgive me for being moved. I'm always moved when I see these works. Um, I, I, I understand that some of them can be a little bit odd <laughs> or maybe well, they're very, of... they're very eccentric. And, and I remember we came across this bison or bison and cow or whatever's going on down there. Um, in the lower right hand corner, we yes. came across that in the course of our research for Uninvited and it was too early to fall within the scope of our exhibition. But what struck me about it was the ambition of making such a large, I mean, these are these two paintings are big. They are large. And, and a lot of technique. And how did she come to have such painterly technique at this point, given well, you know, the disadvantages that most black women had in this period? How did she, how did she manage this? Absolutely. And, and even if it, it, as I propose, even if it was from copying, I, 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 especially with the 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 Highland Cattle, the uh, 1906 painting, I, I can't, I can't help but feel that perhaps that was um, perhaps gleaned from a magazine cover, maybe a travel, you know, um, brochure. Even if they were they were you know copied, the 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 execution of the works are really they're really great. So I, I have to believe that hmm. she had some form of training and that is my ongoing <laughs> research. Yeah. I mean, even the theme of Highland cattle for a, a black woman in you know, Nova Scotia, it's, it's, it's like obviously painted into this imagined um, white past in, in, in Scotland. I mean, Highland is Highlands of Scotland, right? So it's presumably. So it's, it's a really curious and eccentric picture, and, and we we all really loved it when we came across it, but I hadn't seen any of these others. Shall we go to the next slide? Very lastly, I actually, yeah. through my search on the Highland cattle, I did re I did find that, um, I believe it was, uh, Alberta or Manitoba at one point had Highland cattle, which kind of led me to, to the presumption that perhaps there was a, a brochure that who knows her her yeah, father yeah. going on the rails mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah. Picked up and was able to you know bring home and she was able to see it um so it's it's yeah. it's uh, it's a very intricate fuzzy you know um bit of research but those are all the different types of avenues that yeah. one okay. one try and 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 you know lock down a a, a history a narrative and fill in the gaps um i would like Please uh, move. Okay, so yes, um, um, McDonald lived in Africville, as you can see here. And if you could move to the next slide, please. Perfect. And um, just in conclusion, I wanted to share these three lin lin linoleum cut prints that are at uh, on display at the Africville Museum. Um, these were produced by McDonald's daughter, mm -hmm. Dr. Ruth Brown Johnson, who was a um, passionate community activist, teacher and advocate. Um, and she in fact received an honorary degree of, degree of humane letters in 1991 from Mount St. Vincent University. And what's very um, you know, moving about having these three um, uh, linoleum cuts is, is the, the suggestion of the continuation yeah, of tradition. an investment in art making, in art practice, and and I believe these were done in 1949. And so, I'm just gonna uh, pop us forward to Clara's mum. Yes, absolutely. Just because I'm, I'm um, watching a little bit of our time and realizing that we should probably talk for another five minutes or so before we switch over to Clara. Oh, absolutely. And I'm happy to agree with you, so I don't should. misrepresent. <laughs> not at all, not at all. <laughs> so um, uh, Edith Drummond Clayton was a longstanding resident of East Preston, Halifax. 
and was a professional basket weaver whose baskets can be found in collections around the world um, and include and sorry around the world and also in fairs across Canada. The teaching and, and we think that she offered um, attracted international students. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. No, it's fine. I, it's all good. Um, so yes, the teaching and weaving classes that she uh, offered at, attracted international students and she received the Queen's Medal in 1977 representing Nova Scotia and represented Nova Scotia at the 86 Expo Pavilion in Vancouver. A descendant of the Black refugees of 1812, Clayton was born in Cherrybrook, Nova Scotia. The rib technique she specialized in was passed down from mother to daughter for over six generations, highlighting in particular the importance of oral tradition as a part of knowledge sharing within African Canadian communities. Indeed, Canada's Atlantic provinces have a long tradition of basketry as exemplified by the basketry of Micmac and Malicite First Nation peoples. In an interview, Clayton revealed, quote, when, when we use dyes to dust, when I use, sorry, when I use dyes to decorate ba the baskets, I obtained natural dyes from Micmac women that arrived in little brown sacks, end quote. Hmm. This in particular is another great insight into intercultural um, collaboration between Indigenous peoples and African and Black Canadians um, that, con that continues or that is yet to uh, be further explored. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, but not least, mm -hmm. I would like to introduce Canadian American artist, Artist Lane, who is a descendant of fugitive slaves. She was born in North Buxton, Ontario. And her work, and although her work is renowned in the United States, where she's based, and in Europe, her work is seldom to rarely ever featured in Canadian art reviews. Perhaps most Sorry, perhaps more, more Canadians would be more acquainted with Artist Lane's great aunt, Mary Ann Shad Carey, the erudite abolitionist teacher and notably the first Black woman to publish um, a newspaper, The Provincial Freeman, in North America. Uh, you can move to the next Fascinating. Slide. Where was that newspaper published? Do you um, in in if I'm I know it's in southern Ontario? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I believe it's Mary in, I, be, I believe it was in Buxton. Mm -hmm. I I apologize for if I'm incorrect, mm -hmm. but, but I welcome the correction. <laughs> um, yes, um, in conversation with the artist, Lane rec recounts her discovery of art as a child on her grandparents' farm, where she would fashion figures from mud. But it was in it was in Art Ann Arbor, Michigan, where her father was able to find work during the Depression, where Lane was first introduced to art classes. Returning to Canada at age six, by high school, Lane was making portraits of her classmates. And upon graduation, she was awarded the scholarship to the Ontario College of Art in Toronto. Three years later, having been awarded another scholarship to study at the Cranbrook Art Academy, Lane later moved to Detroit, Michigan. A career spanning over 50 years, Lane's central themes and inspiration include civil justice, spirituality, and metaphysics. Her, one of her most noted commissions was one by President Barack Obama for a bust of Sojourner Truth in 2014. In closing, I hope that, um, that this provides some information uh, um, about the yet to be un uncovered narratives of Black Canadian artists. Thank you. Fantastic, Adrienne. And it's, it's so interesting because, you know, these are very difficult um, histories to unearth. And, you know, we, we uh, you know, I'm so, I'm so impressed with the lengths that you go to to try to recover these, um, these stories. And you're making fantastic headway, but it's not without an enormous amount of determination and, and attention to detail and you know forensic police work. So congratulations Absolutely. on that. We're it's, so we're so glad to have you with us. Thank you so, so much. 
So here is Irene Selena Sparks Drummond, the mother of the basket maker that we saw before. And I wanted to show you, Clara, um, here she is in her garden in Cherry Brook. And here are her baskets that we borrowed from the Nova Scotia Museum. And beautiful baskets they are too. And we have them in a gallery. Um, I just have this picture, Clara, of the, yes. you know, the baskets being brought to market in, in Halifax. And we have you know, this photograph as well as the photograph of, of your grandmother in, in the case with the baskets. And they're, they're displayed, um, oopsie, sorry, I'm missing a slide. Um, they're displayed in a room where there is a, a painting by um, Prudence Heward of a black woman with her clothes off. And she's obviously been asked by her privileged, you know, white boss. She was a woman that worked in the household to disrobe and serve as a model for this woman. And the painting is a, a very uncomfortable uh, portrait as a, a black nude, but it's very uncomfortable. And so it was, it, but, but, but an extraordinary painting. So we wanted to show it, but we wanted to create a context for the picture in which we would look at, you know, black, black subjects in Canada at this period outside of the frame of the ex exoticizing white gaze of artists who were, who were very fond of pa painting black subjects, of course, the many black models working in art schools all across Canada. That's, that's another whole story that some colleagues of mine at the AGO are working on. Who were those women and men and, and what, what are their backstories? But these, um, these baskets are doing sort of mighty work in the show, Clara, to you know, tell us about you know, what, where black creative energy was in women at this time and this, this rich, rich tradition of basket making in Nova Scotia that your family has been so much a part of. So thank you so much for being with us. And, and can you tell us a little bit about having Irene Selena Sparks Drummond as your grandmother and, and presumably learning from her and from your mother and the family story of coming to Canada? Yes. Well, I started with my grandmother uh, going to the city market in Halifax. And I was about eight years old when my grandmother was making a basket and she set up one basket, a small one, and she gave it to me in my hand and told me to finish it. And I looked at her and I said, I, I don't think I can do it. And she said, you work on it and I'll come back to you. She mm -hmm. came back to me and she looked at it and she said, you're, you're doing okay. I looked again and I was, I got a quite a bit weaving done on it. And she said, you're doing good. But in the meantime, it was a lady walking back and forth past the table. She was eyeing the basket and what I was doing. And I thought, you know, this lady's really watching me. And I'm in my mind, I have a lot of thoughts. And that one of the thoughts came, I wonder if I'm finished this basket, can I keep it? <laughs> and I, I never forgot that. But when I finished the basket, my grandmother, I remember her saying, you done very well. And I said, oh, can I keep it? The lady wanted to buy the basket. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I want my basket. And I cried. Oh. And she said, no, dear. She said, you'll be able to make more. And from that on, I've been making baskets ever since I was around eight years old. Wow. I've traveled with my mom, my grandmother, the picture in there with my grandmother in the flower bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I used to leave Preston after I got older, <coughs> walk down to Cherry Brook, because that's where I was born, mm -hmm. and help my grandmother pick flowers, vegetables to take to market in her long flat baskets. Mm, like the one in the middle here. Yes. Those would be for flowers. And yes. what about the, those two other baskets? Would they have been used for they fruit would, vegetables? Yes, or? they would be for for vegetables or fruit or anything that was mostly the market people that carried the baskets. Yeah. And so and you would carry everything to market in the baskets. In the baskets. The fruit and yes. vegetables and flowers and then sell the baskets too sell the basket, sell the berries or whatever was in the basket. Sometimes they would sell the basket itself. Yes. And then they'd go home and make more. Make more. Yeah. And how long would it take you, you know, working with your grandmother or your mother, how long would it take to make a basket? Well, to them, it would, at that time, they were, they were making their strips a lot 
finer than I make mine now because mm. it was the larger splits are more filling. Mm. The smaller ones, it takes longer and they're, they're tiny finer. little finer. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, but in the, in the years of watching my mom, my traveling around, I've been traveling around with them all my life. Mm. And after my mom passed away in 1989, her and I had just returned from Harbor Front in Toronto. Oh yeah, that's where, that's where Gaytan's museum is. Yes. <laughs> Go <Harbor And>, <laughs> We just returned home in uh, two weeks and she passed away in church. Oh, and she always said, when she, when she passed, she would want to be serving her Lord. Mm. That, that was her main words. And my sister and I walked in church. We were supposed to pick her up, but she didn't wait. She got someone to drive her to church. And as we walked in and walked two seats behind her, we were set, sitting in the seat and we just sat down. And I heard somebody say, oh, Mrs. Clayton stuck sick. Oh. And she said, they said, first they said, that Mrs. Clayton said, here's my two daughters, Martha and Clara. Mm -hmm. And that's the last word she spoke. Oh. At that time, I, I went to the hospital with her and I knew she was gone before she left the church. Mm -hmm. But she always gave me that assurance. Yeah, that, I mean, it just sounds like the family had such an incredibly strong bond between the yes. generations of the women. And when you were when you were weaving with her, uh, when she like, I guess you guys would probably, you know, do this together in the evening or whatever. Was it was it um, the weaving and the talking were kind of yes went together? Um, like my my, I have six sons, one daughter. So at that time, they were only just little kids. So hmm. I would leave from where I am today and go down. I only lived a couple doors down over the hill from my mom. And I would go down in the afternoon and my mom would be weaving away and her, her strips is just flipping. Mm -hmm. and she's talking the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she said, you take these home and when you get the kids settled in bed, then you can weave them. And I thought, well, I have other things to do. <laughs> but she always assured me that there was time for the baskets yeah, and it right. was time for the baskets. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad now that I took the time mm -hmm. to follow my mom and my grandmother's footsteps. It was, it was tiring. Friday and Saturday was hard work. Yeah. To me, it was hard work at that time because mm -hmm. I was only a young girl and I just wanted to be with my friends and whatnot. And, you know, they they laughed in different times and how can you do it? Mm -hmm. But to me, it was an, an enjoyment for me. And I, to, to this day, I can't do without a piece of maple. <laughs> it, it's, right. it's like it's instilled in me. And where do you get the maple from these days? Well, I started when I, after my mom passed away in 1989, I had to go in the woods myself and look at the trees and find out which maple tree was the best or whatever. And what, makes, and what makes a maple tree the best? Like, what do you look for? Well, I look for a straight maple, yeah. young maple, and with no knots. Mm -hmm. Because the knots, with the, the knots is like a limb that's been broken off. Right. Mm -hmm. So it has to be a straight piece of maple. And I, <laughs> I had to go in and show my son, and my brother used to always get my mom's maple, so he started getting maple for me. Mm -hmm. So I took the both of them in the woods and we started. This is how you look. do it. Yes. <laughs> so but now I, I don't have to go in the woods myself at all. No. Hey, Tan, you were going to say? Yeah, I just had a question. The, the shapes of the, of the different baskets, um, is this like, a, a, I guess it's a tradition passed from daughter from to mother to daughter. Yes. mother to daughter yeah. and then um do you did you ever did they ever expand in terms of other shapes or it was really you know those shapes is what is needed to for the you know oh, for yeah. the and the and for the market but did they ever expand i mean 
feels like you know somebody with first world problems like did they have time to experiment other shapes no. just for the the beauty of it it was no. very practical yes no. okay and they weren't ones to take in pictures they was always shy of the camera mm -hmm. until late years and my mom started you know just say oh, oh okay i'll take a picture for now you know mm -hmm. but that wasn't their thing they just all they knew they was weaving a basket and that was it their money for the week for the groceries or whatever to help to look right. after the children and whatnot. And exactly. so how many, how many in a week did, did, did they produce? Well, in my mom's time, she could, she could do about 10 a day. Oh, wow. wow. She, was wow. Just, she, she would have the long strips just flipping. Wow. When she, when she got good at it, boy, she was, and she could talk, she could talk on the telephone. She could talk to somebody coming in the house at the same time and still weaving. Keep going. Yeah. So she did she so she would do her chores, like her daily work, and she'd be always weaving simultaneously, or was there a time of the day when she would do it? No, by 10 o'clock in the morning, her little house chores was done. Okay. The day was moving. Including her 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 meal to meal, because my dad used to work. And after that. It was her baskets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and Clara, who taught your grandmother how to Her weave? mother, which was Mary Sparks. Mary Sparks. And she passed away before I was born. She passed away in 1936. And where? how did your family originally come into Canada? Were they part of the 1812 yes. migration of people into Canada? During That's when my grandmother came to Canada, yes. One of the things that I learned in Jolene Gordon's beautiful mm -hmm. book about yes. uh, Nova Scotian baskets is that the, the style of these baskets is not actually derived, as one might have thought, from African basket making. It's derived from, from a, a Celtic tradition of basket making that comes to Appalachia via the indentured French and English servants. Yes. Or, or indentured servants slash slaves, really. Um, that were brought to um, the Appalachian region and the Chesapeake area, and that they shared uh, right. they shared quarters with the enslaved Black people, mm -hmm. and these technologies of you know these techniques of basket yes. making were transferred, and then there's the migration north into Canada, bringing that tradition with them. So it's it it is again it's a braiding of multiple traditions before it yes. even gets before it even gets to Canada. But yes, how big, how big a, a, a is the sort of basket weaving you know, community in, in Halifax and in and around these communities uh, near Halifax today? Is it an active group? Is it a small sisterhood? Is it a- I'm know, the a only one really that's carrying it on at this mm, time. Really? I have a sister and um, she can weave, but she doesn't like it. She doesn't like it. She doesn't like it. Mm. And, uh, she doesn't go anywhere to sell baskets, do demonstrations and whatnot. Right. But I've been going to Alderney Landing in Dartmouth, the mm -hmm. farmer's market, since my, on my own since my mom passed away in 1989. And what, do you go there on Saturdays? Just on so Saturdays. Yes. Next time I'm in Halifax, I'm going to yeah, me too. God, be sure yeah. to be there. So and, I have, and, and you have to document it. For, for posterity because yeah I, I, that, 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 that's a technique that we yes. can't lose, you know? Yes. Right. And do you have, Clara, any of your own baskets anywhere close by? Oh, that yes. You, that you could show them. us? I have tons of them. And then we should probably take some questions because I think it's seven o'clock, but this has just been such a pleasure. Okay, I don't know if you can see. That's one little one. And that's that one I can, I can make in an hour. Whoa, or less. Maybe Jen, we should stop sharing the screen and just yeah, look at Clara. I was about to say, Sarah, would you unshare your like stop share so that yeah. we can see bigger? There, there we go. go. Perfect. And we Clara, we want to see your baskets again. Can we, we show again? Get, uh, yes. Hold it up right in front of your face. That's a cornucopia. Wow. Cornucopia. Oh, wow. That's a different one made with oh with the a dye. A dye. Oh. This is another one. This is I made this one years ago, and this is a paint. Okay. Oh, 
That's a and, and Sarah, there's not young people uh, gathering around your knee to learn how to make baskets from yes, you. Yes, there, there's. I do a lot of teaching in schools. Mm -hmm. I travel around. I've been to Savannah, Good. Georgia. I've been to um, Montreal, Toronto, Quebec. Vancouver, all those places. Can you show that one again more to the camera? Because it looks beautiful. Oh, wow. wow. Love that. And I, I make them big ones, big, okay. big, big, large ones. I have one of my grandmothers, my oh, great wow. and my great grandmother. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Now, this is my great grandmother's, which would have been Mary Sparks. Wow. And all that left was the handle. The handle goes right around, comes up. Yeah. The dark ribs, that's all was left of the basket. So you've kind so of I it with my splits. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I want to do it over in a dark color like this one. Yeah. But that's, that's, that Mary, was that's Mary Sparks, and, and then she passed the, away before I was born. So, and then the one, the brown, the browner the brown one. one. That one is Selena. Irene, Irene one Selena. Selena, which is my grandmother. Right. That one was all broken, and I repaired all the bottom and stuff. Wonderful. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, and I have a, the last bunch of splits that my mom made, Edith Clayton, in 1989. Saturday before she passed away. I have a cornucopia, small one. I have a tiny little one. Uh -huh. and I can see each other. That's so nice. But the other one is on display. So I, that's my one. Okay. And these are the strips that I make now. You make now, yes. yeah. Which are larger than you can her. see these strips are smaller, a lot smaller. Than yes. Splits. Yeah. And this yeah. is one of Selena's, which is my grandmother. Do you ever get tempted to try and make it with those tiny little strips? I have like done, your yes. Yeah. Crazy is so slow. Over there on that table. And there's a basket there, tiny little one. Just, <laughs> one. Just one second. Yep. This is the and Nico Day who's helping us with technology there. If that people are watching, See it? Yeah, so there's the maple in the hallway on that table. <laughs> this is the maple that I use only in longer, longer yep. strips yep. for right. a larger basket. But for a small little one like this one, I can use this piece of wood. Wow! And I use a knife. I have a little, little knife here, mm -hmm. and I, I use a hammer, a little hatchet, and a saw. That's to make when I do the big large basket, and then after I cut it with the hatchet, I can do it with the knife and make the small fine splits like these. And and that's the way. Paper thin. Yeah. So we should probably uh, take some questions if there's some questions. Um, you know, table, I, right I, the <laughs> oh. Clara, one of the questions that has come through is if you could repeat where it is that your baskets are available for sale. I think you're amassing a few many future customers <laughs> through the Zoomosphere. Yes, exactly. Well, I usually just sell them right now since COVID come in, in, in place. I haven't been to the market since December. So I get orders and I have baskets in the gallery in Muscadabra Harbor, and I also have some in historic properties in Halifax. Yeah, different different museums that mm -hmm. where they have the basket. Did you find it? No. Oh boy. <laughs> That's okay. Take your time. Um, go get it, Clara. Can I go get it? Yeah, go yes. get it. Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what's funny is that um, many of the questions that have come through have been answered by, you know, as we went, because Sarah and Gaetan and Adrian all, I think, had similar uh, questions. So they've been asked, they've been answered as we go. That's wonderful. Oh, oh. now see, that's, that's the very fine strips. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And my son brought this basket for me. And he said, I bet you can, because they always try to channel me with different things. Yes. <laughs> you can't do it. So I showed him I could do it. Wow. You, you sure did. These are the fine, tiny splits. 
So was your mom and your grandmother, just one last question, I guess, before we wrap up pretty soon, but were they great storytellers, these two women? No. Oh, no. <laughs> my, mother, my mother was. Darn. Your mother was, but not your grandmother. Not my grandmother. Now, this is one of my mother's baskets back in the 30s. Wow. Nice. Lovely color. And it was given to me at the market. A lady brought it and gave it to me. Oh, so, she brought uh -huh. it back. That's so yeah. nice. So, so I have a lot of my grandmothers and my aunts that brought baskets, people bought baskets from them and brought it back to me. And I, they buy baskets from me. That's great. Well, look at Clara, if Jen, are there more questions in the queue there or should we? You know, we um, the, the question uh, section has mainly been full of expressions of gratitude for this great panel. It's people have taken the, the opportunity to say that, that, give their appreciation for uh, convening the, this great group. And I'd like to uh, just echo that and say thank you to our honored guests, uh, Clara, Adrienne, Gitan. Sarah and I feel so incredibly fortunate to have been able to convene this, this distinguished group and to be able to beam your research and your stories and your perspectives out to our audiences. So thank you so much. Um, speaking of our audiences, please come and visit us. This is the final week to see Denise Tomasos. It closes this Sunday at McMichael. Uh, Uninvited and Denise Tomasos both have publications uh, to accompany them, which document and provide further deep insights into these two uh, terrific projects. Um, both of these books have been reprinted due to incredible demand. So get your copy uh, while it's hot. And thank you as always uh, for joining us. Um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you so much.